Mark says you should do a scientific breakdown on what causes boats to porpoise and solutions. To adequately cover the topic, you'll need to get into hull design, weight distribution, bow, stern lifting props, hydrofoils, and trim tabs. There is a lot of discussion and wrong info online. I've not found a thorough YouTube video on it yet. Mark, thank you for subscribing. Thank you for commenting. It's a great topic. We are going to cover a lot of stuff here in this episode. Uh, I do want to say that I am not a boat builder, but I have been on thousands of boats. So this is going to be my experience and some of the things that I understand and how I know certain different things. We're going to cover a lot of different words like, you know, strikes, chines, dead rise, beams, all that kind of stuff. There is another comment from Mauro Alvarez. Can you have a video about beams, 8'6", 8'10", 9'0", 9'6", stability in rough weather, comfort for center consoles, and such? So we're going to cover a ton of topics and different information about boats. One thing I do want to ask everybody, though, is that I want to do like a giveaway of some sort. I have got a ton of Marine Tech Tools, Gauge Saver, Rid Lime. I got tons of koozies. I've got some total boat stuff over here. I have some other stuff that I got from the boat show, like key floats and stuff. I've got a couple of shirts that I can't wear. Like I have a large, um, here is an, a cell. This is a electric outboard company, a cell. That's a large polo. I've got some gauge saver shirts. So just comment below. Tell me what, uh, you know, give me some ideas on how to do a giveaway of some of this stuff that I've got a ton of, and I just don't use it. So I need to give it away. So you let me know what would be a good way to give it away in a good interactive way. Obviously everybody needs to be subscribed to the channel. So thank you. Now let's start this whole conversation off by talking about the dead rise. So the dead rise of the boat is basically the V. Now the V is going to change based on the type of boat and the different stability. So in the front of the boat, it's going to have a deeper V than in the back of the boat. Now your dead rise, you know, can be 10 degrees, which is going to be very, very shallow. Like a flat bottom boat is going to have a zero degree dead rise, which is you know, it's a flat bottom boat, but then the rest of them start somewhere around 10 degrees. Uh, and then they will continue to go up, 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 up. So like, you know, this might be a 40 degree dead rise, which is very few boats. Um, you're talking about speed and different things like that. When you get into those higher dead rises, because you're trying to minimize drag and you're trying to get less of the boat in the water. Now the dead rise is also going to affect your draft. The draft is going to be from the water line to the lowest part of the boat. So with an outboard, the bottom of the skeg, when you've got it trimmed down, that is the draft of the boat. Well, I guess some companies won't include the outboard. So if you trim the outboard out, like if, if you're on a flats boat, stuff like that, it doesn't really give you the draft with the outboard down in the water. It might have like an eight inch draft, which is basically the boat, not necessarily including the skeg because you're going to be floating. So the different type of boat is going to vary as as far as what is considered draft, but just think about draft as waterline to the bottom of the boat or the bottom of the skeg of the outboard, the lowest part. So the dead rise, the deeper the dead rise, the deeper it's going to be in the water. Most offshore center consoles are going to be somewhere in the 20s, like a 20 degree dead rise or a, I'd say anywhere from 21 to 26, somewhere around there. And the dead rise for most of them that you see on the specifications are going to be at the stern. Let's say a 21, 22 degree dead rise boat is considered a DV boat, but in the middle of the boat in midship, it might have a 28 to 35 degree dead rise. So as it goes from the stern to the bow of the boat, the dead rise is going to be getting bigger, 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 bigger. And then, you know, that way it can cut through the water. The middle of the boat is basically where you're going to be taking most of the wave action. So as you're going over waves, most of the waves break somewhere around the middle of the boat. So, you know, 28, 35 degree dead rise somewhere in there around the midship is pretty common for a deep V boat. I would say that 
You want to be over 20. So rough water conditions and offshore boats, most of them are DVs because that deeper V gives you more stability in rougher water. Whereas the flatter it is, the less control and the less stability. That's part of like a sailboat. That's why sailboats have a massive keel in the middle of it. Some of them have a retractable keel. Some of them are, you know, just a straight up glass into the hull. And that keel down in the water is what helps stabilize the boat because it's, you know, down in the water. So it's all kind of a weight and stable type of thing. Think about that same concept with your DV and the more of a V, the more stable you're going to get. That's going to be the dead rise. Most boats are anywhere, I would say 15 to 25 degree dead rise is going to be most of your boats, depending on the type. The larger and rounder the boats are, the less dead rise you're going to have. But center consoles and boats like that are mainly going to be in the 20 to 26 degree range. Now, the next thing that I want to cover are going to be chines. We need to talk about chines because that is an important feature. So the chines are basically where the gunnels of the boat meet the bottom of the boat. So your DV or your dead rise is the V of the bottom of the boat. And as it goes up, it hits the gunnels. The gunnels are the sides of the boat. And the corners there are going to be your chines. So you can have a hard chine, a soft chine, a reverse chine, or like a sailboat doesn't have a chine. Some sailboats don't have chines. It's just a rounded edge there. So the chines are very important because it's where the water comes off the boat. And once you get up on plane, it's stable. So a reverse chine is more on, it's on a lot less boats, flats boats, bay boats, stuff like that, where you've got a very, very low gunnel height. And so everything is so low to the static water line that the spray comes up over the boat. So reverse chine is the hull goes up like this and it comes up and then it kind of like dips down before it goes up the gunnels. And that will create the splash and push it down. And that's what a reverse chine is. Most other boats... Um, your cuddy cabins, your center consoles, your bow riders, all the rest of you. Know, most of those boats either have a hard chine or a soft chine. Most of them are probably, I don't know what the exact different, you know, the exact number percentage between a hard chine and a soft chine on the different amounts of boats are. I would say it's probably 50, 50 hard chines are like a straight 90 degree. And then, um, soft chines are more rounded. So that's kind of what a chine is. Certain boats like flats boats or bass boats, you hear people talk about chine walking, which is when the boat gets up on and on plane, it's going so fast that if it gets a ripple in the boat, it can walk back and forth between the chines where it's just hitting off of the chines as you go along. That's chine walking. Then we're going to get into strakes. So the strakes are the actual lines that go down the the boat. So you've got the keel, which is the very middle of the boat. And then as you go up the hull, there are different lines that go up to the front. Those are strikes. They are there for a couple of different reasons for lift. So you've got the keel of the boat and then it'll go up a certain, you know, maybe it's 12 inches, maybe it's 18 inches, depending on the boat and the boat builder and the use of the boat. And then it, the boat hull will kind of like curve off like this. And then it'll be like a 90 degree there almost like a chine, and then it will go up again, it'll flatten off, and then have another line there. And that flat spot is going to give you lift. And another reason that you have a strake is to allow, it creates air bubbles. And the more air bubbles that you have underneath the boat, it releases the boat from the water, which relieves your drag, which gives you the ability to increase fuel economy, increase speed, and stuff like that. But it's important to understand the difference in the strakes and the chines because the dead rise also plays into the strakes. Certain boat builders, certain designs are going to have, let's say from the keel of the boat to the chine, you have say three strakes. Well, this one right here, the first one between this strake and the keel might be a 20 degree dead rise. And then between the second and the, th and the 
the first strike and the second strike, it might be 22 degrees or 23 degrees. So you can have a variance in that as well. And that will also change the ride of the boat. Now, those are basically your strikes. They create the lift, they create the bubbles, and they relieve drag. And also, they might, you know, also help with spray. So some of them might be kind of reversed, not really reversed. Most of them just go straight over, flat, and then 90 up with a hard chine on it, basically chine. Then we're going to need to understand the beam of the boat. So the beam of the boat is basically the widest part of the boat. So it's going to be up to the boat builder and the type of boat that you're going to want. Obviously, the wider the beam, the wider the boat, the more surface area the hull is going to have. It's going to be more stable, but it's going to be slower. It's going to have more drag. And then the skinnier the boat, the more tippy it's going to be and the faster it's going to be because you have less drag and it's going to be slicker. So generally, I mean, there's not really like a true that I've found, not really a like true... Again, I'm not a boat builder, but formula, I would say. Not really formula, but a mathematical. There is no like standard. So let's say that a boat is 24 feet long. There isn't like a 3 to 1 or 2.7 to 1 or a ratio of how wide the boat's going to be. The width and the beam is usually based on what type of boat it is and what it's going to be used for. So... Most 24-foot center consoles are going to be around the 8 feet, 9 feet range, which is close to a 3 to 1 ratio. So I think it's like 3 to 1 plus 1 foot. So if your boat is 24 feet long and you divide 24 by 3, you get 8. And then you add 1 foot, that gives you 9. So it's 9 feet for the beam. Most 24-foot boats have a beam of about 9 feet. Some are 9.3, some are 8.6, some are 8. So there isn't really like a ratio of 24 divided by 3 plus 1. That's a good like general idea, but it's not that standard because the use of the boat is what ultimately determines what the beam needs to be. Like a skinnier boat is going to be faster, but a wider boat like a cuddy cabin, something like a sport fish. So if you've got a 30 foot sport fish with a 12 foot beam, you know, your ratios are all messed up, which is not an uncommon thing. There's a lot of sport fishes out there in the 30 foot range that are a lot wider because that's the design of the boat. Whereas like say a 39 CV usually has I think it's an 11 foot beam and then like a 38 formula is going to have a 11 six. I think it's got 11 foot six inch beam and you know, fountain, same thing. The 39 fountain, I think has a 11 six, maybe even a 12 foot beam, but, or no, it might be 11, 11, three. I think it's 11, three. Again, it's going to range depending on the boat builder and the type of boat, but it is going to play into the stability. So as far as it goes for talking about the, the different aspects of the boat, those are the main things that you need to know. Dead rise, chines, strakes, the beam, and the length of the hull. Those are your main things. The next thing that we need to talk about is going to be freeboard. So freeboard is the distance between the deck and the waterline. So, you know, how high is the deck off of the waterline? And usually freeboard is, is calculated from the boat manufacturer to account for the use of the boat and the amount of cargo or gear that you're going to be putting on the boat. So if you load the boat with, say eight people at 200 pounds, 250 pounds a piece, plus a thousand pounds of ice and gear, you know, you just put a few thousand pounds in that boat. That's going to make the boat sink down. So the freeboard is going to need to be a specific distance depending on what you're using the boat for. Because if the freeboard is too shallow and the deck is too close to the waterline, whenever you get, say, four people on the side of the boat and you're trying to pull a fish in, you could get healy and tippy, and that will create a problem where if you have you know deck drains and a wave comes over and you've got water coming into the boat now, that can be a problem. So it's very important to understand those terms. 
That's why some boats are more tippy. As soon as you get into like, if you've got a 21 or a 24 foot boat with a 24, 25 degree dead rise, that's really shallow. And like an eight foot beam, eight, six, that's not that long. And that's not that wide. And that is a very deep V. So the deeper the V, the tippier the boat's going to be. Whereas the, the lower the beam, it's not as tippy. It's more stable. So if you've got a deep V, 24, 25 degrees, 24 foot long boat, and you you don't have that much freeboard, then whenever you get two or three guys on one side of the boat to try to pull a fish in, that could be a problem. And there are a few boats out there that do have problems like that, S- specific models. I'm not going to say anything about names or anything like that, but just understand those kinds of things. And also gunnel height, I think is going to play a big factor in that too. So if you've got really low gunnels, like, you know, older sea crafts and stuff like that, you've got like these really shallow gunnels. So if you've got a large freeboard, which means the deck is very high off of the water because it doesn't drain to the bilge. It goes straight out over the deck and the deck drains straight overboard. So you've got a high freeboard, but you've got low gunnels. So now when you're fishing, let's say the gunnel only comes up to, you know, just below your knee. That's kind of a problem for a lot of people because, you know, the boat might need to be manufactured with a lot of freeboard because of the way it's being used. But those low gunnels, now if you're on the side of the boat and you've got your knee above the gunnel, I mean, you need that brace for trying to pull in a fish or something like that. So... It could be a problem, and taking that into a effect whenever you're looking at boats and stuff like that, that's just something to think about. Now, as far as getting to the right ability and the porpoising and all that, now that we have a good understanding of the deep V and the dead rise and making it tippy, the freeboard, the skinnier the boat, the bigger the deep V, the more tippy it's going to be, now we can actually talk about what makes it porpoise and stuff like that. So everything on the boat has to be centered around weight distribution. The more weight you have in the front, the more the bow is going to go down. It's going to affect the ride. The deeper the V, the more like it's going to get cutty. You're going to be cutting through the waves. And if you got more, you know, if your boat is bow down and listing to the starboard, it's going to always be trying to pull the boat. As you're pushing the boat through the water, that list like this is going to try and make the boat turn, which is going to create, you know, this, this horrible ride where you're constantly having to correct it because it won't steer straight. And if we start talking about, there's different ways that you can put the outboards on. I'm going to mainly talk about outboard boats because that's what I know the best. But like if you've got an outboard boat, you usually either have a, you know, the outboard straight to the transom and a cutout. So the transom, you know, you go to the back of the boat, you've got the transom of the boat and you've got a cutout and the outboard is attached right there to the back of the boat. Or you could have a Euro transom where you've got the transom of the boat and then it's like, you know, pushed out another two feet. And then the, and then it's like, you know, there's like a, a wet well, a splash well back there. And the outboards then attached to the transom back there. Here's the back of the boat. It goes up. It's almost like it's a transom, but it's not really a transom. And the transom of the boat is here and the outboard can trim up into that splash well. That's usually called a Euro transom or you have brackets. So you have the transom of the boat. The boat is all encapsulated. You know, it's just all one solid piece. And then you've got a bracket that is attached to the back of the boat. And then the outboards mounted to the bracket. Now we're starting to talk about weight distribution and the LOA, which is length overall. There's a big discussion that a lot of people will get into debating what the LOA really is. So the length of the boat, what constitutes the length of the boat? LOA, which is the length from the back of the outboard to the front of the bow pulpit or the anchor. Or is it, you know, the water line around the boat? Or is it from the bow of the boat to the transom and excluding the outboards and the bracket and all that? So, like, you used to have a 25 Dusky, which had, like, a two-foot bracket and then two more feet for the engines. And then you had a bow pulpit with the anchor, which is another, like, two feet. So you got this boat that's, like, 
25 feet, but really it's like 31, 32 feet, depending. So that's kind of the discussion of, or the thought that I'm going to go here is that the actual boat itself in the water may only have from the bow, the bow is going to stick up out of the water. So from the bow where the water is to the back of the transom where, you know, the water is, you might have 25, 26 feet. But because you got two feet with the outboard and you've got another two feet with the bow and the anchor, the weight distribution, there's more weight in the back than there is in the front. And so that can make it get tippy. So when you see people take older boats and let's say the outboard is normally mounted to the back of the transom, not a Euro transom, just straight to the transom. And you remove the outboard, you put a bracket, and then you put like, you know, let's say you put a jack plate or something on it, or you just have it straight to the bracket. You've moved the weight of that engine all the way back. And most boats that people are doing this with normally would come with a two stroke. Well, a two stroke is a lot lighter than a four stroke because a four stroke has more internal components. You've got the oil that you're carrying. You've got valves. You've got weight. There's a lot more moving parts. Whereas the two stroke Let's say it weighs 500 pounds and your four stroke equivalent weighs 700. I know they've gotten most of the weight down on most of the new technology on the new four strokes, but for the past 20, 30 years, four strokes weighed more and it's been a problem. So if you take off a 500, 450, 500 pound two stroke and you add a 700, 800 pound four stroke, you just added 300 pounds. But if you added a bracket that weighs, let's say, another 300 pounds, you've actually added 600 pounds to the back of the boat. And now you've taken this boat that was designed to have, you know, it's designed based on the weight. So the weight of the two-stroke and, and where the length of the boat is in the water, it's going to ride phenomenally. But you just took the boat, added two feet, to the back with the bracket and added 600 pounds and pushed 300 of those pounds two feet back with the two feet of the outboard. It's four feet back basically. So now you've got the back of the boat is way more heavier or way heavier than the bow of the boat, which is going to create a pendulum effect. So if you take the center of the boat and you were to put it on, you know, a needle and have the boat like this, Normally, with its design to basically be, you know, level, it's going to sit there like this because it's been had weight distribution in the design of it to where it will sit like this. But when you put all the weight in the back, now it's going to be like this. It's tippy based on where the center or the pendulum point of the boat normally is going to be. Now, whenever you put that boat on plane and start going, the waves are still going to be hitting that midship. So like we were talking about with the dead rise and having like a 28 to 35 degree dead rise in the middle of the boat where the waves normally break, if you've got all that weight in the back, those waves breaking in the middle, it's going to sink the back down and bring the front up. And then once you get the back of the boat over to the back of the wave, so when the wave is coming like this, your, your boat's going to push over it. So whenever your boat is pushing over like this, You've got this weight, it brings the bow up, but then all of a sudden, as soon as this finally gets enough weight to fall forward, it's going to slam forward and lift the back up and be driving into the next wave. That gives you your porpoising effect because it's just the physics of it. It's just kind of how it works. So when we're talking about, you know, porpoising and being able to get rid of something like that, then Thinking about how you created it is going to be crucial. Also considering the tippiness of your boat and where the center point normally was and your weight distribution. So if you put an extra 600 pounds in the back, then you need to be able to distribute weight more forward into the boat. So let's say the batteries and the oil tanks were in the back of the boat and you want to repower with a four stroke and add a bracket. Well, how much did the batteries weigh? And if you move them up to be in the middle, in the center console or up towards the front, you can centralize that weight, which will bring more weight forward. Or you can maybe add anchor chain to the bow. So if you're up in the front, if you add 
say 20 feet of anchor anchor chain to your anchor line. Um, maybe that gives you another 50, 60 pounds, or you might even have to add weight in other ways. Maybe put sandbags or something in the bow of the boat to get that weight forward. But the more weight you add to the boat, the less freeboard you're going to have, which brings us to another issue being that you go from a two stroke to a four stroke and you add a bracket to the boat and then you try and add more weight to you know level all this out now all of a sudden you took a boat that had a freeboard of let's say it had 12 inches of freeboard and you just added say a thousand pounds to the structure of the boat that may bring your freeboard down to say nine inches and then when you reload the boat with all your cargo and all your gear and use the boat the way you normally would use it, now all of a sudden, maybe you only got three, four inches of freeboard. So thinking about these kinds of things is going to be pretty important when you go to like repower a boat or buy a boat and seeing what's been changed to the design. Because if you've got only say three, four inches of freeboard and you're out there fishing or whatever in, in rougher waters, depending on where the deck drains are, where the water's supposed to deck drain out. And then like you see it a lot on older boats, to repower four strokes, especially smaller boats, 18, 21, stuff like that with the weight of four strokes, which is less than it used to be like Mercury's new V eights. I mean, the V sixes, all these things, they're, they're really, really close to being, the same weight as the two stroke. So it's not as big of a problem, but if you added that weight to the back and the scuppers in the back, whenever you walk to the back of the boat, now all of a sudden you push the scuppers down under the water and now water's going to be coming into the boat. That's kind of the problem that I would say is going to be the number one problem that needs to be thought about when talking about all these different aspects to the boat and what makes it ride well or not well and what makes it a good boat or a bad boat because if you've got this boat that's been altered in these different ways it's going to affect the ride and the functionality of the boat as well i would say the bigger problem though is that if you make all these changes then you need to i'm trying to i'm trying to put it into words where like we're talking about trim tabs and hydrofoils and stuff like that you're trying to you know put a band-aid on a problem where ultimately you took a boat and added a thousand twelve hundred pounds and weight to it to you know upgrade it and now you want to put trim tabs or a hydrofoil on there or a stern lifting propeller to get the stern out of the water to try and get it to ride the way it rode before which you can't always do more of a discussion on understanding what you're doing with the boat and what you really want to accomplish and how it's going to affect it is more important than understanding the trim tabs and the hydrofoils and the stern lifting props and you know weight distribution and all that stuff understanding the beam and the dead rise and the chines and the strikes and the way it all goes like it all affects the ride talking about drag let's talk about drag for a minute because i don't think we really covered drag which every boat has drag the strikes kind of help with that creating air but when you start adding transducers and through haul fittings and say like scoops and trim tabs and you know zip wakes all these other things everything you're adding creates more drag. So the more drag you have, bottom paint, it's going to slow the boat down and it's gonna burn more fuel. Trim tabs, you know, some like Seakeeper rides and other trim tabs, zip wakes, they do say, you know, it, it has been shown that some of them do increase the fuel economy based on the way it is being used. But at the same time, if you don't know how to use the trim tabs or you're adding other stuff, then it's it's creating more drag, which is going to make it ride worse. So a trim tab, think about a trim tab. Let's just use those for the main example because you understand that the transducer and the through hole fittings with scoops, water's coming along the bottom of the boat, and those are objects with the water hitting it. That is creating drag. So those things, there's not much you can do with it. 
that's only going to matter for like people that are really trying to get speed out of the boat that you're going to see any difference. Other than that, the trim tabs are the number one thing that you're going to see a big difference in fuel economy and boat performance because you're altering the way the boat rides. On the back of the boat, you have trim tabs or zip wakes or whatever. You're taking a tab and you're pushing it down like this, which is creating water coming along the bottom of the boat, and it hits this tab, which flows down like that. That is going to give you stern lift, but at the same time, it's going to make the bow go down. So if you've already got a problem with you know, the bow being down in the water and then cock, you know, listing to one side or the other, Trim tabs are going to make the thing worse. And same thing for like a hydrofoil or a stern lifting propeller. Anything that gives you stern lift, the, when the stern goes up, generally the bow is going to go down because of the weight and just the drag and everything like that. Trim tabs are way more prominent in doing that opposed to like trimming the engine Let's talk about that real quick because I didn't really say anything about that. So engine height is very important. The engine height on the back of the boat. The back of the boat on, on an outboard, you've got an anti-ventilation plate, which is on the lower unit. And then it is supposed to be above the waterline. So, and I'm talking about waterline as far as the water that is coming off the back of the boat. Water coming across the bottom of the boat, as soon as it gets past the back of the boat, it's going to try and go up. And generally, there's either two calculations that people say. You can either get one foot means an inch or a half inch. So the water coming off the back of the boat, after it travels a foot past the back of the boat, it's either going to be an inch or a half inch higher than it was when it came off the back of the boat. So if your outboard is, let's say, a foot back, you want that anti-ventilation plate to be half inch or an inch above the bottom of the hull because... When the water comes off the back of the boat and it goes up, it, it's supposed to hit the anti-ventilation plate and then ride across the bottom of that. If your outboard is lowered down too far where that anti-ventilation plate is below the hull of the boat, when the water comes off the hull of the boat, it's going to go over the top of the anti-ventilation plate. This is going to create a, a pull. So think about the dynamics of water. If you're spraying water on something and it hits, it's going to, you know, you're, you've got force on it, which is going to pull down. So if that water is going over the top of anti-ventilation plate, it's going to pull the back of the boat down into the water, which if you've got drag and pull on the back of the boat, that is going to make the bow go up. And if you try and take your trim tabs and run those down to create stern lift, you've got the trim tabs fighting the anti-ventilation plate and then the bow of the boat also being forced down. So you've got these three different elements that are all fighting each other in order to control the boat, which in certain water conditions, the boat's going to ride horribly and it's all based on you know one thing that's wrong. So thinking about what is the ultimate problem and trying to fix that before adding a hydrofoil or anything like that. So if you, let's say the anti-ventilation plate is below the hull of the boat and you add one of these hydrofoils to the back of the boat, you're going to make the problem worse. And then if you try and trim it out, it's going to dig even deeper because the water coming off, when you trim the engine up, the anti-ventilation plate, it's just creating more of a downward force. And if you make it wider with a hydrofoil, it's going to make the problem worse. So understanding what is the root problem, that's probably the more important thing to figure out before we try and add things to the boat in order to try and make it ride better, like to get rid of a porpoising effect. Think about why is it porpoising in the first place and let's try and fix that. And then we can, you know, talk about performance enhancing things like trim tabs, like hydrofoils, like stern lifting props, like inverting the engines to create more stern lift. If you've got twin engines, th those are going to be the, like a whole nother discussion. But I think that the main thing to talk about is going to be, you know, if we're talking about, you know, scientific breakdown on what causes boats to porpoise and solutions, it's going to be the weight distribution and the design of the boat. So if you take a boat, 
that is X feet and you change the weight and push engines back or you add weight to one section of the boat, let's say you don't even add an outward bracket or anything like that. Let's say you add a trolling motor and you put three lead acid batteries in the front of the boat at let's say 50 pounds a piece for the lead acids. You just added 150 pounds plus let's say an 80 pound trolling motor. I mean, you just added 230 pounds of weight to the front of the boat. So now this boat has probably got the bow pushed down and now you're trying to, let's say, let's talk about trimming real quick, just so we can kind of talk about another problem and the porpoising effect of adding weight in the bow of the boat compared to the back. So when you trim an engine, this is the boat and this is the engine. When they're completely straight, everything's plowing. You know, it's really, it's, it's working as much drag as the water's going to give it, that's what you're pushing against. And when you try and pop up on plane and ride up like this, the boat generally is kind of like tilted. But if you trim the engine, that creates downward thrust, which is going to create stern lift. It's going to you know bring it up. So that's going to relieve the drag and make you kind of ride more on top of the water, which is going to give you a better performance. But when you trim the engine up and get that downward force, it's going to bring the bow up out of the water. Now, that is what you're going to be trying to do if you add a bunch of weight in the front. I would probably say that if you add all that weight to the front and now you're bow plowing, meaning that, the, you know, let's say the trolling motor, that's probably not the best example because it's not going to make it list, but based on the batteries, if they're not centralized, that could make it list. And when you put the weight in the bow and it pushes the bow down, now you're going to be, you know, bow plowing through the water. And depending on the waves and the current and the wind, it could be, you know, trying to constantly be pulling to one side or the other. And you're trying to eliminate that. And as you eliminate that, when you trim the engine and try and get to get, you know, the bow out of the water, or you try and use your trim tabs to get stern lift and push the bow down, you can create that porpoising effect because you have a weight problem and there's not really much of a way to use trim tabs or the trimming of the engine to really correct it because you're always going to be fighting it because the conditions of the water were always going to change. So understanding what the ultimate problem is, it's going to be way better because if you have a problem with the weight in the front, then to fix it, you need to get the weight out of the front of the boat. So longer cables and putting the batteries in the middle of the boat if you've got too much weight in the front, maybe put the batteries in the back of the boat or, you know, freshwater tanks, stuff like that, which is another thing that you alter the boat in different ways, adding freshwater tanks, adding waste tanks, adding heads, adding, you know, live wells, um, batteries, trolling motors. These things that you're adding to the boat is going to add weight in certain areas of the boat, and that's what's going to affect the ride. Too much weight in the back is going to give you that porpoising effect because the weight of the boat is off of the pendulum point and it's going to make it do that porpoising effect. So I would try and figure out what is causing the porpoising effect. When did that start? And then moving that weight to distribute it evenly across the boat before you try and add something to the boat to fix it. And also... We talked about the freeboard and the putting too much weight in the boat and minimizing that freeboard and making it less than what it really should be. So just remembering all these different things and think about them. If you've got a porpoising problem with your boat, then those are the most general things that you need to learn how to you know, control, knowing what those things are doing and how it affects the ride of the boat. That is the most important thing and understanding what your boat is doing and how it's performing. That's all you really need to know. And then once you understand that, you can finally attack what is actually causing the problem and being able to fix it correctly, opposed to adding a band-aid of something to try and make it perform the way you want it to perform when really you have a underlying problem that you need to get fixed first.